History shows us that the more ill-defined the end goals are, the more likely countries are to find themselves deeper and deeper into a conflict that has no clearly defined end, that lasts forever, and that may lead to very um, difficult and unintended consequences. Welcome to Applied Geopolitics, the podcast from the Stratfor Center for Applied Geopolitics at Rain. I'm your host, Roger Baker. Russia's year-long war in Ukraine appears uh, destined for a prolonged conflict. Certainly, um, both sides are preparing for protracted war. Uh, as Moscow focuses its intention on the southwestern flank and on Ukraine, um, it does appear, at least from first glance, that Russia may be losing some influence around the rest of its periphery. So NATO is expanding in the north, uh, Turkey seems to be playing an increasingly important role in the Caucasus region. Uh, and in Central Asia, the Central Asian states appear more willing to be able to um, push back against uh, Russian interests or Russian influence, uh, maybe because they're bolstered by uh, Chinese trade and Chinese uh, transit corridors. So to discuss some of the implications and some of the changing geopolitical balance along the Russian frontiers, I am happy to welcome back today Lasha Kazradze, a graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, academic liaison and strategic business development officer for Sukhumi State University in Tbilisi, Georgia. Lasha focuses on transatlantic security, Russia and the South Caucasus, has written for the Center for New America, and has articles published in journals such as the New Eastern Europe and the National Interest. So welcome back, Lasha. It's great to talk with you again. Thank you so much for having me, Roger. It's great to be with you. So I guess let's let's begin with at least this surface view. Um, when we look at what's happening in Russia, Russia has had a, a less than stellar showing in Ukraine. Certainly it's holding more territory than it was a year ago, but um, by many accounts uh, and observations, Russia has uh, not lived up to the, the hype and expectation of its armed forces that everybody was thinking about a year, a year and a half ago. Um, and in that same time, we appear to be seeing some of the areas that have been additional areas of Russian strategic interest and strategic influence start to slip away from Russia or at least see some waning influence, like in the Caucasus and in Central uh, Asia. What, what are you seeing along that periphery in regards to um, Russian influence and fortunes? Uh, yes, that's right, uh, uh, Roger. With the uh, with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, first of all, in Western capitals, there was this expectation that uh, uh, Moscow would just uh, slice through Ukraine and uh, within uh, just uh, a couple of days take Kiev. Uh, a year later, uh, we are... Uh, seeing an entirely different picture. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Russia is, as you mentioned and allude to, um, is uh, fortunately or unfortunately for the Russians to decide, uh, uh, are hanging in there, uh, I think, uh, steadily, um, uh, prolonging this conflict and uh, the human tragedy that accompanies it. Um, so what does this uh, tell um, uh, us and then specifically um, the region, uh, so-called Russia's periphery or the near abroad? Um, first of all, I would like to notice that uh, there has been um, sort of an excitement uh, that has accompanied uh, um, uh, Russia's uh, entangle entanglement uh, in, in this war. Um, and, um, you know, we see this uh, manifest uh, in, um, uh, again, in the return of this um, uh, pipeline diplomacy um, that uh, has defined the region um, along with its regional conflicts uh, and geopolitics in parallel to that. It has defined the region um, uh, in, in terms of geoeconomics. Um, so... Uh, from the early 90s, as we all remember, under um, uh, the foreign policy chief of the former foreign policy chief of the Soviet Union, Shevardnadze, um, made a great effort to put Georgia on the map uh, geoeconomically uh, by uh, establishing these uh, pipelines uh, that would uh, um, 
uh, that would uh, transport uh, energy from east to um, uh, Central Asia to east and then the, cor the, the, the corridor of the Caucasus onto the uh, uh, Western Europe um, through the Mediterranean. Um, and we see the return of that excitement today um, uh, because the conventional wisdom, sort of the widely accepted opinion, has been that Russia is too caught up uh, in Ukraine to worry about its security concerns in the South Caucasus and the rest of the region. Um, I would call, I would, I would caution, uh, actually, um, uh, those uh, that um, uh, might be. Um, um, sort of promoting that 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 point of view. Uh, that is not to say that uh, Russia is not caught up and entangled in Ukraine, or that its uh, security um, uh, hasn't been, uh, relatively speaking, uh, perhaps. Um, uh, uh, you know, reduced, uh, or that its capacity to project power in the region has been reduced. Uh, but um, I think what I'm seeing here is the same um, sort of um, the that that uh, cycle of excitement that's really based on very superficial um, uh, expectations, um, and so. Uh, and so the idea that somehow Russia's, uh, uh, you know, uh, security uh, interests uh, will no longer be met. By Moscow, uh, just because it's entangled in Ukraine, I think um, uh, is a bridge too far, and it's an, uh, uh, it's it's very premature to judge. Uh, well, well, Russia. Uh, let's explore that for a minute, because if sure. we look at if we look at the South Caucasus, yes. Um, in the last couple of years, we've seen Turkey take a much more active role. Um, and in many ways, in some of the latest rounds of uh, conflict between the Armenians in the Azerbaijan, um, the, the Russians seem to have failed to provide the additional capacity uh, in that region, and thus we see instead that, that Turkey's partner uh, Azerbaijan has, has performed much better compared to the Armenians, and now we have this discourse between Turkey and Armenia of uh, getting past their long and bitter history and potentially taking this steady move toward um, normalization and the the Turks pushing forward on on the idea of the Trans-Caspian um, route as a primary transit route for China, Eurasia, Europe, um, given some of the challenges and problems we've seen in Russia. We've seen the Turks uh, in some ways assist the Ukrainians um, in this conflict. So. Uh, at least in the near term, it does appear in the Caucasus region that Russia's interests are, are, are not being upheld or Russia is, is unwilling or unable to do that. Um, are, are you seeing signs now that Russia is, is pushing back or is this a, a, an assertion that we have to be careful about taking the near term moment and applying it to the long term? I don't... Uh, I think it's a letter, uh, a letter point you just uh, uh, made, Roger. I think um, yes, I agree with you that to a certain extent. Um, this conflict um, has sort of eased up uh, concerns, uh, security concerns. Uh, but I think uh, this is essentially uh, the question of soft power versus hard power, uh, meaning that. Uh, Geoeconomic uh, and uh, geoeconomic and energy projects, as, as as important strategically as they are for the region and the uh, and the countries um, uh, that uh, that that surround the region, um, I think that it would be premature for us to base our analysis and to to form our analysis on the idea that um, there is some sort of a, a, a return of uh, geoeconomic projects um, uh, that will uh, check uh, Russia's uh, power projection capabilities or, reg or interests in its near abroad or, or its per periphery. I think it will be very premature for us to base our analysis on that assumption because um, the latest history is just take past 30 years for Georgia, for example, for the South Caucasus in general. Um, even when Russia was down and out in the early 90s, to from from the early 90s to mid 90s, and then relatively speaking, gaining its strength gradually um, uh, towards the end of the 90s. But nevertheless, 
it was it was far from Russia that we are seeing today under Putin that we have seen under Putin, correct, in terms of power. Um, and yet it still managed to conduct two brutal brutal wars in in uh, in Chechnya, and it it was consistent in its uh, in, in steering the pot in in Georgia with its separatist movements. Um, in, in South Ossetia and Abkhazia, not to mention uh, the events uh, and the uh, Russia's invasion of uh, Georgia um, in 2008. So um, underestimating or short selling Russia um, because of its um, uh, because of its uh, entanglement in in uh, this Ukraine, uh, this awful conflict, um, I think would be uh, premature because Russia, in my opinion, will always have um, uh, that net capacity uh, to project power and to implement its uh, strategic interests uh, in the region, unfortunately. Uh, but I think that's the reality that that's the reality that has not dissipated or gone anywhere. In relative terms, we could make a case that um, it might be sort of um, uh, tra transferred onto the periphery of Russia's uh, current calculations. Uh, but um, again, uh, just to uh, make this point clear, um, I don't think that uh, that's uh, uh, something that is final in terms of Rus Russia's um, uh, reduction of, cap uh, of power projection cap cap capacity and its ability to act on that, on, on its uh, national interests in the region. G given Russia's um, uh, population uh, structure um, and disbursement, obviously, um, Ukraine takes a much higher priority, um, uh, likely uh, the the Russian frontier uh, in the in the near Arctic and along the Baltic is obviously going to be uh, very concerning for Russia. That entire western flank where Russia meets Europe is critical for Russian security because the bulk of the Russian population sits west of the Urals. As we go further east and push out into Central Asia, obviously you don't have that, that large contiguous population zones. Um, in that distant area, your transportation infrastructure starts to weaken as we push out from there. Um, is, is Central Asia, particularly as the Central Asians are able to work with, for example, Chinese investment things, are we seeing Central Asia start to slip uh, from Russia, or at least be more willing to assert their own national interests in the face of Russian strategic interests? Uh, yes, I think uh, there is certainly signs that, of flexibility that Central Asian republics are experiencing vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, their relations uh, you know, with Russia. Uh, Tokayev, um, the president of Kazakhstan, for example, um, is playing a balancing act, um, but um, uh, albeit more f more flexibly, uh, it, 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 you know, Kazakhstan is, is uh, much more confident in its foreign policy and, pursu and, and pursuit of its national uh, interests, uh, especially, say, uh, in, in um, trade and economics uh, with, with Europe. Uh, but that being said, there is still uh, that... Um, uh, early 90s, early 2000s, sort of um, uh, stigma that accompanies um, uh, this strategic culture uh, and strengthens that strategic culture of um, deference towards Moscow. Um, and so, again, I think I would like to um, sort of repeat this theme where uh, even though there are um, you know, uh, windows of opportunity to perhaps diversify uh, and even decouple uh, from traditional dependence on Moscow. Um, I think uh, that there is it's, it's a long ways out before uh, either Central Asian republics or South Caucasian republics, um, in relative terms, of course, um, decide or are ca or become capable of uh, completely separating their, uh, you know, national security and uh, national economic goals uh, from Russia and just independently conduct business either with East or the West, which, uh, obviously uh, is being with, with, with China mostly, uh, as it also has uh, enormous interests in the region. Um, 
so uh, I, I would call for uh, uh, caution uh, in this in this scenario. Um, uh, but um, there is no doubt that uh, because of this conflict, uh, uh, Russia is very much preoccupied with it uh, and its relative power uh, and capacity. Um, has um, uh, might have uh, relatively declined. I, I just wanted to add one more thing in, in terms of uh, Russia's treatment of um, uh, Armenia vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis its conflict with, with Azerbaijan. Uh, again, um, I don't think that this is a, um, uh, you know, this is a defining moment where Russia is losing Armenia uh, or that its capacity uh, uh, to uh, go back to, so to speak, uh, control of Armenia um, uh, to, to benefit its own national strategic interests um, has gone away. Um, I think Armenia is, um, is, is too small for Russia to uh, worry. Um, and I think uh, the thinking in Kremlin is that, that they can always um, uh, uh, get back to that problem if for some reason uh, it got out of hand or Armenia decided uh, or exhibit, uh, starts to exhibit um, um, uh, some sort of um, a firm uh, independence, uh, independent foreign policy. There will always be that spoiler element that Moscow will be capable of implementing. Um, and yes, we do see uh, as a result of this um, uh, more deference shown to, to Turkey uh, as, a, as one of the major uh, regional powers. Uh, but this is, again, this is mostly uh, push and pull geopolitical interests that they sort of divvy up um, in the region. Uh, but on individual level, uh, a country like Russia, um, I would argue, uh, still maintains um, its uh, influence in terms of uh, security, and, uh, in terms of projection of uh, power capabilities and meeting its security needs. So, so let's let's explore that a little more. I know. So, in part, I guess what you're saying is, from your from your perspective, it it's less about a lack of Russian capability. Than about a prioritization at the moment, um, and maybe that the Russians don't feel that they need to be as assertive in other parts of their periphery, um, but they obviously have a, a real uh, issue uh, along the Ukrainian frontier that needs to take up the most of their attention. Um, but secondarily, you've you've brought up multiple times the idea that it's you know it's it's way too early to count out Russia, um, mm -hmm. and and I know in in U.S. Uh, assessments of Russian strength and capability or Soviet strength and capability in the old days, it would constantly have these um, wide swings between, uh, you know, the Russians are 10 foot tall soldiers and and then they're totally incapable of doing anything. And and there's it, it there's almost a um, uh, politicization of the assessment such that it is either the United States needs to rush and keep up with the Russians or um, the United States needs to not worry about them because Russia is totally weak. Why are we wasting our time and wasting our money? Um, what would you say, though, if we're really trying to step back and take an assessment of Russia, not from these extreme positions, what are the core strengths that Russia continues to hold that gives this country longevity despite these wide swings, both in external perception and, quite frankly, in internal um, political and economic strength? Um, yes, uh, Roger, I agree with you that there has been this sensa uh, sensationalization of this problem, um, uh, and therefore a miscalculation, um, I would say, uh, on part of the we collective West to um, to continue, uh, that continues to, I would say, underestimate Russia. Now, there is no doubt that Russia is a much weaker state. Uh, you have the United States, then you have China, and you have the distant third Russia, which is the weakest um, 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 sort of great power, I would say, uh, nuclear power um, among the three. Uh, but again, you know, from and, and my analysis on this is. Um, strictly based from the regional perspective, uh, because no one denies that Russia is a weak is a weak power, struggling both with its economy and its army. But it's been more. But both its economy and its army has uh, have demonstrated uh, 
more than enough capacity to handle and implement and act on their regional interests. So it's more than enough for uh, for Russia to deal um, uh, and to and to act upon its interests regionally. Um, a good case can be made that Russia is not seeking um, to. Uh, contrary to the, again, sensationalism and, and polarization of the issue of Russia trying to, uh, you know, uh, conquer Western Europe or, you know, and, and engage in a major warfare with NATO. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's the calculus in Moscow. Moscow very well, I think, understands uh, policymakers there, what its capacities are. Um, so to go back to your question, what sustains Russia's resistance and, and this capacity to be a spoiler, um, there are a number of issues. It's a cultural, strategic culture, uh, collective psychology, uh, Putinist, nation, Putinist version of nationalism. Uh, these variables matter. Um, uh, humil- you know, sort of Putin's, um, uh, you know, viewing Putin as someone who uh, uh, plucked Russia out of that uh, humiliating 90s, uh, the miserable uh, in in which Russia found itself in an embarrassing economic and political situation after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So on the socio-cultural aspect of it, nationalism uh, aspect of it does matter to sustain sustain Putin's uh, revanchism. And at the same time, let's not underestimate uh, hard power, tangible power capabilities. I mean, we all thought uh, in the West that uh, um, these harsh sanctions would do uh, Russia's economy in. And yet a year later, uh, the rubble still has not collapsed. I mean, we can, no, no, I'm not an economist and let the economists sort of uh, uh, be, uh, analyze this, this, possibility of Russia in the long term, you know, collapsing, but, um, uh, you know, today the conventional wisdom is that Russia has not collapsed; its economy has not collapsed, and it all, at the same time manages to maintain uh, power projection in Ukraine. Um, so, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, I think Putin did um, uh, a good job in 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 preparing Russia for something like this, because Ukraine was always on its uh, on the radar, strategic radar of Russia in the long term. Um, so I think that's the sort of a, a overall package of reasons uh, that I believe, um, um, you know, allowed Russia to sustain itself, both militarily in terms of security and economically. So, so I guess if we, part of it is about reframing uh, the perspective of Russia. If Russia is seen in the Cold War um, Soviet Union concept of global superpower, and right. these days in return, there are questions as to whether that was ever completely accurate. Clearly, mm-hmm. that is not the Russia of today. But if we look at Russia in terms of of its ability to exert influence within its region, and we see the Russians operating as far you know, into Syria, and we see them operating still in Africa and other places, but, but strongly within the region, then Russia is clearly a strong regional power um, and if the if the issue of nuclear weapons were taken away, we would have a very different view of Russia. Again, not as a global superpower, but but still probably as a regional power, particularly because of the 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 vast mineral resources, the vast energy resources that Russia still possesses. It may not have a huge population, but it still does have a decent sized population. Um, it's got some strategic depth in certain parts of Russia that gives it the ability to to take some losses around the periphery and then push back out. So I guess there are these sustaining things and, and again, reframing it as a, as a regional power um, instead of in that old um, uh, Kremlinologist or Sovietologist viewpoint. Absolutely, yes. And that it's that regional power that it has managed to sustain and uh, capped as more than enough for countries like Georgia uh, to be extremely careful. And then sort of going back to the original uh, theme uh, of the program, uh, not to get excited too much about um, um, some sort of a possibility on the horizon that Russia is uh, declining once again because of Ukraine. It will always have that one extra Kalashnikov, Roger, <laughs> to be able to um, to implement its um, uh, brutal 
interventions uh, in in you know in Georgia, the likes of which we um, uh, we've seen. Well, well, actually, on that point, it, mm -hmm. indulge me for a moment because I think it may be um, <laughs> uh, important to think out. Um, so, if we look at if we look at the current conflict in Ukraine, Ukraine, the government in Ukraine clearly has an end in mind, which is the 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 reclamation of all of their lost territory, including Crimea. It doesn't mean they can accomplish it. Russia clearly has an end in mind, which, in its limited extent, is probably um, holding eastern Ukraine and and the land connections to Crimea, keeping Crimea for its Black Sea ports, um, and uh, creating at least some buffer space between the West, NATO and Europe, and Russia, um, emasculating uh, Western Ukraine, or at least creating some middle space between that Russian frontier. Um, the West, however, which has been supporting Ukraine, doesn't seem to have a clear focal or end goal. It's constantly moving around from don't let Ukraine completely to collapse to let's just stabilize the situation to increasingly under maybe social pressure or, or um, that perception of Russia on its back foot, uh, the increase in midterm and long term arms to uh, supplies to Ukraine, um, dreams of uh, a, a resounding defeat for Russia and Ukraine and maybe even the the collapse of Russian capabilities. I know early in the conflict there was a lot of talk by Western leaders of making sure that out of this conflict Russia would never have the capability right. of launching an invasion of its neighbor. Um, but it, it, history shows us that the more um, ill-defined the end goals are, the more likely countries are to f find themselves deeper and deeper into a conflict that has no clearly defined end, that lasts forever, and that may lead to very um, difficult and unintended consequences. And I mean, most recently, what was the what was the ultimate end goal for Afghanistan? And now we see what's happened with that. There was Vietnam for the United States, and on and on. We can go through history. Let's let's play a little game in our in for 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 the last part of this discussion. Let's assume that the extreme idea happens. And, and Russia is so far on its back foot that it starts to fragment and, and crack apart. What would be some of the implications we would need to be thinking about uh, to better inform now the goals that the West may have in assisting Ukraine? Um, I, I agree with the picture you just um uh, you just painted, Roger, because this is a very desperate situation, and you are absolutely right when you say that the West doesn't have a clear-cut goal. Uh, what it has, unfortunately, or or what is happening as a result of this is perhaps unintended consequences. So we have, so the more desperate Russia becomes, the more cornered Russia becomes, and we know this. There has been a lot of discussion about this. The the higher of chances and, and, and more chances of increased probability that Putin might use that, that, that awful weapon, that nuclear option, uh, because it's simply viewed, he and his inner circle and the security apparatus of, 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 of the Kremlin, they view this, as, view this as an existential threat. And if there's anything that international affairs and history teaches us is that great powers do not tolerate uh, uh, being um, thought of themselves as as um, as uh, disappearing or having another uh, major power um, dramatically uh, reducing uh, and um, uh, reducing their um, uh, you know capacity to project power or defend their national interests. So. If West collective West continues with this, yes, the question is, to what extent, and then what is Russia going to do? Meaning, if, for example, it starts to lose, say, even eastern Ukraine, which is which is non-negotiable for Russia, it's either do or die. Um, so I think that would be an extreme case scenario. The other possibility, say, for example, the nuclear option, um, they will change their mind that that will never happen. Uh, hopefully. Well, the other possibility is that a, a, a destructed uh, uh, Russia uh, is uh, in and of itself presents an enormous challenge for the West. Uh, 
what is going to happen to the nuclear po- uh, nuclear arsenal of because remember that you know uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union the major concern for for Washington was was what to do with uh, how to secure the nuclear uh, arsenal left over from uh, from uh, the Soviet Union so if for example in a hypothetical scenario just to push the theoretical boundaries a little further uh, Russia com- completely collapses and Ukraine wins um, with the help of uh, uh, the United States and the West. Um, do we really want that scenario to uh, to materialize, uh, where there is uh, chaos and mayhem on the largest in the largest country of the Eurasian continent? Um, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think that's a smart policy to pursue or to hope for. Um, and then that will. What will that do to China, for example? Will China be um, emboldened to um, uh, to sk- go back to its irredentist uh, sort of dreams? What will they do with with Japan? Um, there is that whole Central uh, Asia Eastern frontier that Russia has, as you mentioned. Uh, and uh, will will uh, is is this just a fantasy what we are talking about, or will the West really divide up this enormous country and the territory? I mean, this is a hun- highly unlikely likely uh, scenario and picture because Russia just won't stand there and let it happen Um, uh, because it it faces an existential threat if that scenario were to materialize. Uh, And the fundamental reason why every power um, seeks to, you know, uh, gain nuclear weapons is to avoid to survive and to avoid such a scenario from unfold, uh, to face such a scenario, and so I think that's an extreme. Uh, that's an extreme um, uh, sort of a view uh, and 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 a possible uh, a very tragic scenario that I, I really wouldn't want to uh, even contemplate. Uh, but yes, I, I do agree. I do agree with the uh, basic premise that uh, this is um, uh, there is no end in sight at this point. Now I do believe that uh, this war will come to an end, um, how is another question. But uh, the idea that Russia will give up an inch of the territory in the east, as critical as it is for its survival, um, I think is wishful thinking um, in, in, uh, in Western capitals, and a very dangerous one at that. So yeah, as we look at this, I think that, that there, are, there are a lot of outstanding um, questions that need to be pursued. And in looking at that that geopolitical balance, um, not only from sort of the the outside quote objective viewpoint, um, but also from uh, as you seem to be bringing up a couple times in the Russians, um, what is the um, national perspective of geography and geopolitics? Right, the West argues Russia doesn't need Ukraine and it doesn't need Eastern Ukraine and. It's perfectly secure without them. The Russian point of view is different. The West counters that the Russian point of view is invalid. But as we know, there is there is um, the objective structure of the earth and the objective uh, reality of where certain borders are and things like that. But a lot of political decision making is not necessarily based on that. It's based on the subjective interpretation. And that is a much deeper, longer, cultural dynamic um, and well different countries may disagree with that it doesn't mean that each country doesn't actually firmly believe that viewpoint that's right well i think this brings us to this whole concept of it doesn't matter what we think of or what russia thinks what matters is what russia thinks or what the united states thinks uh, we might russia might be Again, making a mistake, maybe Russia could have listened to the collective West and believed that, say, for example, NATO expansion was not directed against it. But that is not the way great powers, former empires especially, operate, because there is, as you point out, a very subjective strategic culture uh, that every country has. Some can act on that strategic culture, others can't you know, depending on their relative sort of political, uh, economic uh, uh, capacities. But we see that it doesn't matter how we look at Russia, what we want Russia to do. What matters is what we do 
and then how Russia will react regardless of what we think. Um, but the warning signs, nobody can argue, make the case that the warning signs against this uh, uh, um, haven't been there. I mean, Putin for the past decade plus has been arguing that uh, expansion of NATO and the question of Ukraine uh, was Russia's uh, uh, national security issue. Uh, and there was a red line. Um, and so, yes, there is reflective foreign policy um, based on, uh, you know, cultural aspects, strategic, uh, strategic culture of a nation um, that uh, we've seen uh, sort of Russia sort of uh, uh, demonstrate very openly, by the way. Um, he, you know, Putin's ultra-nationalist uh, intellectuals like Dugin, for example, um, uh, they, you know, they are the beacons of this subjective understanding of where Russia is supposed to be. They don't much care about what the West says or um, tells Moscow what about what not to worry or worry about. So they don't, they don't, they're not. That's not the concern. The concern is what they see the West is doing. Um, so. Uh, you know, absolutely, the introspective sort of, uh, you know, subjective uh, uh, social construct and that, that sort of backs the vision of geopolitics and foreign policy does does matter. Although certain, certain theories in IR uh, would disagree with that, that domestic politics do not matter. But I think in, in, in Russia, I think um, this culture has been forming for a long time. Uh, and now we see, it, uh, you see, we see that in practice. Well, I, I think with that, um, now is as good a time as any to br bring this discussion to a close. I definitely want to follow up on some of these issues later down the road, but I think we've uh, run the gamut from the, uh, the, the concrete reality of the battlefront to the uh, uh, philosophy of, of geopolitics and um, <laughs> na national self-identity. Um, yes. uh, so I really want to thank you for, for this conversation, Lasha. Thank you very much, Roger. I was, I was happy to be with you. And thanks everyone for listening. We've been uh, talking with Lasha Kazradzi, an analyst on Russia and the South Caucasus and on transatlantic security dynamics. If you would like to keep up with the latest discussions and assessments of the shifting global geopolitical balance, visit rainnetwork.com and sign up for alerts and information from the Stratfor Center for Applied Geopolitics at Rain. That's R-A-N-E network.com. I'm Roger Baker. Thanks for listening.